This engine never ran under its own power. One of the main problems facing diesel arose from the high pressures inside the cylinder. An exact quantity of oil fuel had to be sprayed finely and accurately through a dense wedge of compressed air. It was found that the fuel pump by itself could not do the job effectively. So an air pump was added which could blow the fuel into the combustion chamber. The principle was similar to that of a perfume atomizer. The method was known as air blast injection. By 1894, a completely new and redesigned engine had been built and preparations were complete for the first trial run. ignition was a practical way of securing combustion and an engine could be made to work on this cycle. By 1897 the first reliable engine had completed its test. Limitations in engineering methods had made some modifications necessary. Nevertheless the engine had an efficiency of 27 percent far higher than any other engine of the day. By the turn of the century, the diesel engine was in regular production. The first models built under license were large single cylinder units with a maximum speed of less than 200 revolutions per minute. Manufacturers in various countries made some modifications to the original design, and a few horizontal engines were built. These were reminiscent of Ackroyd Stewart's earlier engine, but with much higher compression and no hot bulb. The diesel was ideal for driving electric generators. With the rapid expansion of electrical power, there was a demand for larger engines with more than one cylinder. With the development of more power, engineers soon realized that the diesel could be adapted for marine work. By 1912, the first ocean-going diesel ship had been built. The Zelandia of 7,400 tons was built at Copenhagen by Burmeister and Wayne. Her maiden voyage to Bangkok created a sensation in the marine world and marked the beginning of a close association between the diesel engine and the sea. Within a few years, hundreds of new vessels fitted with these engines were to be launched from shipyards all over the world. Today, one ship in every four is diesel driven. The success of the marine diesel was due partly to the adoption of the two-stroke cycle for large high power engines. During the first stroke, the air inside the cylinder is highly compressed. Injection then takes place. Toward the end of the power stroke, the burnt gases surge from the cylinder and are replaced by the incoming charge of pure air. 
The first stroke is the same as the compression stroke in the four cycle engine. The second stroke combines power, exhaust and induction and completes the cycle. The advantage of the two-stroke cycle is that it allows a working stroke for each revolution and therefore delivers more power for a given engine size. But more power was not the only requisite. There was a demand for smaller and faster engines for certain purposes. Comparatively, light engines for submarines had been built before 1920. But the air blast injection system was cumbersome, inefficient, and unsuited to high speeds. There seemed to be a limit to progress in this direction. During the 20s, however, a new system of airless injection was perfected, and the air blast method was superseded. The so-called jerk-type pump meters an exact quantity of fuel which is delivered at high pressure and broken into a fine spray at the injector nozzle. The injection pulse is synchronized with the engine speed. The development of precision airless injection was a landmark in diesel history. Here at last was the opportunity to build an engine which would be light as well as powerful. Ten years of hard work and patient research were necessary before the high-speed engine could go into regular production. These engines are more sensitive than the low-speed types, and a great deal of work on combustion problems and the development of new fuels and lubricants was necessary. Then there were other aspects. For example, trucks, tractors, and small boats fitted with high-speed diesel engines may have to work in regions with temperature well below zero. Practical tests of starting and running at these low temperatures were carried out in special laboratories. This is only one example of a vast field of research and experiment which lies behind the production of the modern diesel. Today, engines of all types and sizes are in large-scale production throughout the world. Medium speed engines for express trains, small high-speed engines for trucks and buses, diesels for tractors and bulldozers and agricultural machines, miniature engines for model cars and model aircraft, huge double-acting types for generating electrical power and for driving ships, two-stroke and four-stroke engines for a hundred uses. The diesel has always had a reputation for efficiency and reliability. Like every other machine, it owes much to the past. To Ackroyd Stewart, whose early work laid the foundation for the solid injection engine. To the pioneers who discovered how to turn heat into work. To the scientists who learned about the nature of heat. To the engineers who have adapted their theories to practice. And to the petroleum technologists who have constantly developed new and better fuels and lubricants. It is through their work and knowledge that we have the modern diesel, the most efficient and most versatile of all heat engines.